together today in this very historic courtroom, first put into use 124 years ago, for the, for the as we all witness the newest event in Supreme Court history, the investiture of Mark Massa as the court's 107th justice. We're honored today by the presence of each of you. But we, I do wish to note that among you, there are several government officials and other special guests that I'd like to acknowledge. I'm going to begin with my colleagues on the bench. We have Justice Sullivan to my right and your left, <clears throat> Justice David, and Justice Rucker. And this is the empty chair that will soon be filled. From the Court of Appeals, Judge Najem, Judge Kirsch, Chief Judge Robb, Judge Mathias, Judge Riley, Judge Friedlander, Judge Darden, Judge Barnes, Judge Bradford, Judge Brown, and Tax Court Judge Martha Wentworth. Representing the, all of us, the state of Indiana, and whom, from whom you'll hear more in a minute is Governor Daniels. Lieutenant Governor Becky Skillman, Attorney General, <laughs> Attorney General Greg Zeller, <laughs> Secretary of State Connie Lawson, <laughs> Auditor Tim Berry. and Solicitor General Tom Fisher. We have a federal official with us today, and that's the U.S. Attorney Joseph Hogsett. From the legislative branch, we're pleased to have Senator Brant Hirschman, Senator Randy Head, and Representative Ralph Foley. Right. And did Senator Bray come in too? Yes, very good. A common face around here, retired Justice Randall Shepard. And with him, former Justice Ted Bohm. And former Tax Court Judge Tom Fisher. We also have Amy McDonald, the wife of the former Chief Justice. And my wife, Jan Dixon. Three of the members of the Judicial Nominating Commission who gave the governor such fine three finalists to choose from are here, Molly Kitchell, Jim McDonald, and Bill Winningham. From Judge Mass's law school alma mater, we have Dean Gary Roberts. And Bar Association presidents, Eric Chickadance, president of the Indiana State Bar Association. Dan Vinovich, president-elect of the Indiana State Bar Association. and Scott Chin, President of the Indianapolis Bar Association. And you will meet several others as they take part in today's program or are introduced by Justice Massa. 
Before we proceed further, however, I would like to invite Father Robert Sims to the lectern to open with an invocation. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come together today in a spirit of celebration. We celebrate the rich heritage of our nation and of our state. We celebrate a heritage that values the integrity and the worth of each individual. We celebrate a common commitment to speak truth, to nurture justice, to live compassion, and to end violence. We celebrate a system of checks and balances that seeks to make real the pursuit of the common good. We also come together to pray. We pray for Mark Mazza, that he will make his own the words of Blaise Pascal. Justice and power must be brought together so that what is just may be powerful and what is powerful may be just. We pray that his commitment to wisdom will continue to grow and to deepen. We pray that his decisions, his words, and his very life will invite us to live lives of integrity and compassion. And lastly, we pray that in the midst of all that can divide us, we will work together to build a society that is truly just. We ask these things through our common God, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father Sims. And now I'd like to ask Daniel Massa, son of our Justice Massa, to the lectern to lead us all in saying our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Dan. And now to continue with the investiture, I invite Attorney Mark Lovers, advisors to Governors Robert Orr and Mitch Daniels, and previously himself a member of the Judicial Nominating Commission from 2006 to 2010, to present his remarks. Mark. Thank you, Justice Dixon. Governor Daniels, Honorable Justices and Judges, friends and family of Mark Massa, friends of this court and of our great state. The pleasant duty of putting this occasion in perspective falls in part to me. No easy assignment in 10 minutes, mercifully for you, 10 minutes. But you wouldn't be here if you were not aware of and indeed have not been a part of the cross currents alive in this time and place. First, to set something of a historical context, as Justice Dixon noted, Mark is the 107th member of the Supreme Court. He succeeds our friend Randy Shepard, who was Justice number 99, the coolest number. <laughs> By my calculation, this chamber, 125 years old next year, has welcomed 71 new Supreme Court members before today. But in modern times, this is a rare occurrence. Since the constitutional amendment that changed the selection process 42 years ago, this is only the 10th investiture of a new justice. The last 20 years have seen only five. In preparing for today, I read one of the gifts of the Shepherd era, this book, Justices of the Indiana Supreme Court, containing biographies of all the 106 members wherein you may learn that none of the preceding 106 have been named Mark. <laughs> also, that he is the 45th of the now 107 who were born outside the state, but the first from Wisconsin. Two cheap firsts, Massa. <laughs> the, path, the path that has led to Mark Massa being robed today is a tale of patience, sacrifice, and faithfulness. The story of healthy ambition mixed with a strong dose of humility. The story of keeping a certain innocent delight at good fortune, and in disappointment, resisting the temptation to cynicism. 
the story of an abiding interest in public service and an athlete's appetite for being in the arena, a place that is the unrelenting teacher that good judgment comes from experience and experience from bad judgment. That same arena, the crucible where vision encounters reality and where is born the practical, the doable. The twists and turns of fate that charted the path to this chamber today, looking back, seem like destiny or an infinite number of character tests or both. In the spring of 1985, I was looking desperately for a speechwriter for Governor Bob Orr. None of the applicants, frankly, could write. <laughs> so I, I had this idea that someone besides me must have had this same problem and that they had solved it and that I needed to find them. And so I wondered, who needs a really great writer? What happened next, I have always considered an inspired flash brilliant, out-of-the-box intuition. But looking back and knowing what I know about how a hundred different things had to happen to bring us to this room today, it is doubtful that I was the author of this idea. At the time, The American Spectator was being published in Bloomington. It was a periodical of note whose readership was demandingly intellectual. If anyone knows where I can find a writer, I thought The Spectator will know. With no hesitation, I cold called the publisher, Ron Burr, a man I had never met nor ever spoken with or again. I explained my plight and said I was sure that in his bottom left-hand drawer was a file with names of writers who he would call if he needed one, and that if he would give me the best three names on that list that I promised that on two weeks' notice he could steal that person back from me with no questions asked. He laughed and said the list wasn't in a bottom desk drawer, it was in a hanging file. He parted with three names, each of which had a short story to go along with how they'd gotten to the list. Of those, two seemed too egg-heady. The third, Mark Massa, seemed intriguing. I presumed the intellect or else he wouldn't have made the list, but Mark had also been the sports editor of the Daily Student which meant that he understood the dramatic moment, how things come together to make a story, the stuff of a good speech. With the help of directory assistance, remember that? <laughs> I made a second cold call to the Boonville Bureau of the Evansville Press. <laughs> Two papers in Evansville and one with a Boonville Bureau. Can you imagine? Mark was sitting there minding his own business. I'd tell him where I got his name. He didn't know Ron Byrd from The Man in the Moon. And I asked him if he would like to move to Indianapolis and be our chief writer. He came up the next week not to talk, but to write. He was a reporter, used to deadlines. I gave him a topic for an upcoming speech and a computer and asked him to write us a speech. I did learn a few things working for Daniels the first time. Even if he said no, I would get something for free out of this. <laughs> it took Mark a couple of hours. John Hammond and I read the speech. It was great. We offered him a $5,000 raise and a parking spot. <laughs> He asked if he could think about it overnight, but one of the things about Mark is that he is wonderfully transparent. <laughs> there is just no guile. He said he would think about it, but he had yes written all over his face. <laughs> we had ourselves a speechwriter. Behind him, values formed by his parents and family, and education that honed the skills that would become his instrument. Thus began, 27 years ago, a web of opportunities and relationships that would culminate here this afternoon. Along the way, he was subjected to the demanding scrutiny of very tough bosses. Al Hubbard, Linda Pence, Susan Brooks, and I take a back seat to 12 years he spent working with the three brilliant graduates of the former College of New Jersey. Shepard, 
Newman, Daniels. It is doubtful we will see a constellation like these three Prince Princetonians simultaneously crisscrossing our public spaces any time again soon, each bringing gigantic intellect, an incredible bias for results, and not coincidentally, virtuoso writing ability. I raise this because it seems to me that the product of the High Court is, of course, judgment. But finally, words. Words that treat the most complex, the naughtiest, the most important ideas and situations. What is required is the capacity to think, to analyze, to sift, to imagine, and finally to land. Mark Massa has these gifts of intellect, and they have been well honed. With scant exception, you will not find someone in this room who is more well-read, who has wrestled more with big ideas, philosophical and practical. Perhaps it is conventional wisdom that sitting on this court requires experience on the bench, but I put to you that what is required is the ability to take the tangle of thought and from it communicate judgment in a way that sheds light, that advances our state, our society. No one I know is better prepared for that task than Mark Masson. And the twists and turns along the way, these amazing coincidences, these tests of perseverance and patience, these apparently chance occurrences, I don't think any of this was coincidence. To anyone listening this day who doesn't know Mark Massa, I say he's a gem of extraordinary quality. His facets have been in the making and cut and polished for years. He will be a great jurist. And Mark, on behalf of all your friends gathered here, I say to you, we are proud of you and we expect great things. Thank you, Mark. I'd now like to introduce Scott Newman, former Marion County prosecutor, 1995 to 2002, public safety director of Indianapolis from 2008 to 10. Scott is going to present Justice Massa to the court. May it, may it please the court, Governor Daniels, honored guests, and to the family and friends of Mark Massa. Isn't this a great thing? I'm not known as Mr. Exuberant. Uh, I'm, no, I'm no Leo Bascalia, but isn't it grand? And on this spring day in Indianapolis, isn't it great to be alive? Truly, there are no words to express all that today means to me and what an honor it is to be even a small part of this event. I say that despite the dirty trick played on me by Mark Lovers, describing my virtuosity of writing before I got up here. Truth be told, after 25 years, I was getting a little tired of making fun of Mark Massa. It was, it was getting too familiar, too easy. I needed more of a challenge. Kidding aside, it is high time to praise Mark Massa, and not just because in a few moments, if all goes well, he'll be a member of the state's highest court but because he is in full measure the person who deserves this high honor, this high responsibility, and our praise and gratitude. The trust we place in him today, he will care for it well. Actually, I wish everybody had an investiture. Then we could all be comfortable getting together and telling everybody that will listen how much we love, respect, cherish a person, a living person. Most of us only experience this sort of catharsis, not at something called an investiture, but rather at something called an interment. <laughs> and that's too bad. The man I'm about to present to you is an admired and trusted colleague and friend. He is intelligent, possesses a high degree of moral courage and intellectual curiosity, 
can engage in creative and independent thought, but retains the humility and restraint to banish the idea that it's for him alone to reshape the world by legislating from the bench. Through his love of literature and history and civic engagement, he consults daily, in effect, with his fellow citizens and with those great men and women who have gone before him. Yet he is iconoclastic enough to envision that better world, that better way, even if it means pulling down from its pedestal a statue or even a statute. He is sturdy enough to speak truth to power when power is being wielded in the wrong way. Without fear, without recklessness, but with a certain joy in the task, he faces difficult circumstances and makes the right decision, even at the point of the sword, where self-interest or expediency would certainly have beckoned in the other direction. Mark probably did not run the mini this weekend, but make no mistake, his is a full marathon. At the finish line of decision-making, his colleagues will find him at the place where they all want to go and must go, at the place where courageous people gather on behalf of us all, perhaps intoning under their breath some jaunty reference to the charge of the Light Brigade, and do what is intellectually and juridically, and in the long run, pragmatically, right. Mark has always done that, and he bears the scars to prove it. He bears those scars with a dogged pride. He is not afraid of scars. As he approached the age of 50, he started playing competitive ice hockey again. You know, that's a sport that's treacherous, difficult, often painful, and leaves its marks on a person. I suppose Mark Massa, like myself, thinks that anything worth doing is like that. Justice Massa will prove to be a fair-minded arbiter, a trusted change agent, and a pragmatic problem solver and consensus builder who still refuses to relinquish high ideals. Nominally, for a period of years, his title was chief counsel in the prosecutor's office when I was there. But he, what he really was was this. He was an outboard booster rocket to my conscience. And you can never have too many of those around when your job is to be trusted to do right. On a more personal note, here's how you know you're getting old. You stop throwing away the AARP solicitations. <laughs> you wear relaxed fit jeans and you think about giving up on that too. Branson sounds kind of interesting and fun. <laughs> you think less about the hip new joint and more about a new hip joint. <laughs> and your former intern or law clerk is on the state's highest court. <laughs> Isn't that right, Chief? <laughs> the fact is, I am old, and Mark Massa and I do go way back, so I can conclude by presenting to you a known quantity, a kind man, a smart man, a hard-working person who knows to the depths of his soul that what he takes on today is a sacred trust. He is a scholar, an athlete, a historian, a literary person, a musician, famously frugal, a passable golfer, and a great dad. He is funny and sad, strong and genuinely caring, intellectual but practical and sensible. He appreciates the finer things in life, like a seat at Lambeau Field, and a brat, a brat clutched in his hand, hopefully paid for by his dad or his brother. <laughs> Greek amphoras that sit in museums are things of beauty, but you know they were meant to be used, to hold wine or oil. Mark Massa's intellect and his heart were meant to be poured out in just this way. This is where he belongs, and I'm just grateful that I was here to see it happen. Won't you join me in sharing that sentiment? Thank you, thank you, Scott. <clears throat> and now, can you top that, Governor? <laughs> Governor Daniels, would you come forward for some remarks and then administration of the oath?
May it please the court. I just love that phrase. <laughs> May all our words here today and the decision that we've made always please this court. I know they will. I uh, knew that uh, with the speakers already assembled, there wouldn't be much to add and much need for me other than my uh, formal duties, which will follow in a minute or two. But I did give some thought to what I might offer that would be additive and that would augment, supplement those things that uh, I knew would be so uh, beautifully and eloquently said about Mark before I came up here. And I decided to concentrate on just one thing. Uh, Massa, among his many previous experiences and preparations for this role, we were reminded began life as a journalist. And some of the journalism that has attended uh, this selection has been, as journalism will occasionally be, accurate but not complete. True, as was once said, uh, doesn't always mean dispositive. And it has uh, bothered me just a little bit that in a lot of the uh, accounts of Mark's uh, movement through the process and his ultimate selection. He's been described as a former counsel to me, which is true but misleading when that's all it said. Because of all the preparations that life has brought together to make uh, for Indiana another great justice of this court, yeah, the time he spent with me surely was the least important and surely made the smallest contribution to his readiness for his new duties. He trained in, under uh, Newman. He trained under Shepard. He trained under Orr for a much longer time than we worked together. And he was a, a prosecutor at both levels of our justice system. When you scan the entirety of the career that led him to this moment, I believe you'll feel that rarely, if ever, has Indiana welcomed a new Supreme Court justice more thoroughly and completely prepared for his duties. There's a second dimension in which that, I think, too casual and incomplete description might have misled some of our fellow citizens, if it led anyone to believe that the choice, ultimately, of Mark for this assignment had anything to do with proximity, our proximity, or our working together. Oh, I have been a Massa fan for a long time, and every day that we spent working uh, together and only enhance that. I know the way he thinks. I know the books he reads. I know the depth of thought with which he reflects on what he reads, what happens around him. I know the heart that he has for people at all stations of life. I know all this, but you know, I pretty much knew that before he came to work for us. And in fact, if any of you can imagine yourselves in the incredibly privileged place that the occupant of my current assignment, my current office, finds himself, herself, you too would know that it is not an advantage that someone work closely with you to their chances of selection, but quite the opposite. You lean over backward to make sure that isn't tilting your judgment. You look even harder at the stellar qualities, and believe me, that it, well, again, thanks to the commission that we have, we had great choices, one of whom I'd already appointed to the second highest court in this state. And so, Mark, the reason I mention this and dwell on it is that I want you to know, first of all, and I want all within earshot to know that you earned this. 
you fully justify this choice. And I would have made it and probably made it more quickly if I had never met you before in my life. <laughs> As I had not met many of the other people that we've appointed to this, to this position or similar ones. And I am pretty sure that those of you who came today came knowing that if after you listen to Mark, lovers, and after you listen to Scott, you were fortified in that view, I'm, I know. But I just wanted to use my moment here to underscore it. I am so confident in the service you will provide. I know it will please the court <laughs> and reflect well on the court. And I am grateful to you for taking up these duties, which you have earned so richly, like all the honors and credit you will earn over what I know is going to be a great judicial career. Congratulations, Mark. Please come take your oath. Solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support. That I will support. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Indiana. And the Constitution of the State of Indiana. And that I will faithfully and impartially discharge. And that I will faithfully and impartially discharge. My duties as Justice of the Indiana Supreme Court. My duties as Justice of the Indiana Supreme Court. To the best of my skill and ability. To the best of my skill and ability. So help me God. So help me God. Justice Massa will now be robed, and uh, I invite his parents uh, to come to the lectern. as part of the job. <laughs> The court will now take a brief recess, if you will excuse us for a moment. All rise.
welcome you, Justice Massa, and now look forward to your remarks as the newest justice of the Indiana Supreme Court. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Well, thank you all very much. As my mom and dad slipped this robe on me, I couldn't help thinking of Bubba Watson last month at Augusta. <laughs> They put the green jacket on him in Butler Cabin after he won the Masters, and Jim Nance asked him to describe his emotions. Bubba said, I never got this far in my dreams. Well, neither did I. I'm also reminded of a scene from the movie Broadcast News. You might recall that William Hurt plays a shallow, handsome news anchor whose career just keeps getting better and better, and Albert Brooks plays the more gifted but jealous network correspondent. At one point, Hurt asks Brooks, what do you do when your real life exceeds your dreams? And Brooks replies, keep it to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't keep it to myself today because my life has exceeded my dreams, and I'm telling you all so you'll know just how grateful I am for it. How blessed am I to share this day with family, friends, and colleagues, past, present, and future. To Governor Daniels, I will know no higher honor than to be selected and sworn by America's finest governor. What a privilege it was to serve under your command for four years at a time of unprecedented change for our state. Thank you for all you have done for Indiana and May you keep finding ways to help us keep our republic in the years ahead. I hope you won't mind me retelling one story that I know you've heard before, but that I just can't help thinking of today of all days. I had a mentor during my years learning the craft of journalism at Indiana University. His name was Bill Pittman. He was an old newspaper man with the Indianapolis News. He taught me reporting and editing, and we stayed in touch my first couple of years uh, out of school when I was a reporter in Evansville. And then, in the first of many lucky breaks, uh, as you heard, I was unexpectedly recruited to Indianapolis by Mark Lubbers to join Governor Orr's staff in 1985. I sheepishly broke this news in a letter to Bill, and I said I hoped he didn't think I was selling out journalism by going to work for a politician. <laughs> a week later, I, uh, I received his reply in the mail. This was before the internet, of course, and I anxiously, I anxiously opened it, and inside I found the most gracious note of congratulations. And he said, in part, that the world didn't need another ink-stained wretch in the news business. But who knows? We could always use another Mitch Daniels. <laughs> I slipped a piece of paper into my old typewriter, and I wrote back, uh, Dear Bill, thanks for the blessing and the absolution. But who's Mitch Daniels? <laughs> I should have known he was only working for President Reagan at the time in the White House. But I soon found out, uh, soon enough, as I said, when I started working for his protege, Mark Lovers, two weeks later. And Mark was the first of many who inspired me to aim higher in the Daniels tradition. And that is why I'm so honored by his presence and remarks here today. I'm thrilled to introduce my family members who could join us today, but first I want to mention my daughter Kelsey, who cannot be here. She is studying abroad this semester in Seoul, Korea, where it is almost 4 o'clock tomorrow morning. So um, Kelsey, if you're up and you're watching live on the internet, or if you're just getting in, um, <laughs> we, all, we all wish you were here. She'll be a senior at St. Louis University in the fall in their pre-law scholars program, and she wants to be a prosecutor. Imagine that. My son, Danny, who led us in the Pledge of Allegiance, turned 18 on Saturday. He will graduate from Cathedral High School in two weeks and will attend the University of Dayton in the fall. He and his sister are the most precious treasures in the world to me. And I'm so proud of them both. They have turned out great. And most of the credit goes to their mother and to their teachers at Immaculate Heart and Cathedral. My sister, Marcia Hendrickson, 
and her husband Kurt are here from Madison, Wisconsin, as is her daughter Lisa and their son-in-law Brett Jondal. My brother John and his wife Mary are here from Milwaukee. Their two children, Haley and Mitchell, are back home in school. My brother Mike, 28-year veteran and captain on the Milwaukee Police Department and one of the great heroes of my life, is here with his sons, Nick and Max. My brother Bill, his wife Cindy and daughter Dawn are here from Milwaukee as well. Now, Cindy is without question the person in this room most surprised by my appointment <laughs> to this court as she still remembers a family vacation 10 years ago when the women beat the men in a game of trivial pursuit because I wrongly answered a question asking, how many eyes does a mole have? <laughs> I thought it was a trick question, and for the record, my brothers were no help. <laughs> my girlfriend, Maureen Keefe, attorney at law, is here. Uh, she, too, is a former Supreme Court law clerk, and her insight patience and support throughout the nominating process was more than I deserved. And then there are my mom and dad, Don and Eleanor Massa, married 61 years. <laughs> the living embodiment of the American dream. 15 grandchildren, four great-grandchildren. My dad's mom came to America from northern Italy just a few years before he was born. He married my mom, graduated from Marquette University with an accounting degree, and he retired as senior vice president, chief financial officer of the Milwaukee Journal Company, where I first learned to love newspapers and the news. They raised a family that loves each other as much as we love them. And I have to share a story that says all you need to know about my mom and dad. In 1969, when I was eight, my three f first cousins were orphaned in a family tragedy, and my parents took them in. My cousins became my brothers on that day, and two are with us here today. A third lives in England and couldn't join us. That's my brother Jerry, and he and I are six weeks apart. So we played on the same Little League team, and we had a teammate named Joey Busalaki. Another. <laughs> great Italian kid and his mom would always sit in a lawn chair up against the backstop. And one day I was swinging a bat in the on-deck circle and Mrs. Busalaki called me over and she pointed to my brother Jerry on the bench and knowing our family story, she said to me, there's a special room in heaven reserved for your mom and dad. I didn't fully appreciate it then, but I do now. And I know she was right. But we're not eager to find out anytime soon. <laughs> So, Mom and Dad, thank you for all you have done for all of us and for being here to share this proud day. I love you so much, and I owe you everything. Thank you. Many thanks as well to two other great influences in my life, Chief Justice Randall Shepard, for whom I clerked, and began an enduring friendship two decades ago, and whose chambers I cannot believe I now occupy. And Scott Newman, the greatest lawyer and most talented friend I have ever known, and a man of inspiring courage, resolve, and grace. Mark mentioned, I like to remind people that uh, while I'm a proud product of the Big Ten with degrees from Indiana University, I got an Ivy League education from three guys who went to Princeton, Randy Shepard, Scott Newman, and Mitch Daniels. You, know, you throw in Yale's Bob Orr and Harvard Business School's Al Hubbard and Mark Lubbers, and you'd think they'd give me some kind of certificate. <laughs> to Chief Justice Dixon and my new colleagues on the court, I can tell you the last five weeks have been the greatest experience of my legal career. Some of you here may not know, but I was quietly sworn in a month ago so I could get to work before this formal ceremony and maintain the court at full strength. A special mention, too, to my colleague, Justice Frank Sullivan, who announced his plans to retire only hours after I was sworn. <laughs> Make of that. Frank, you have served this state so well as budget director to Governor Bayh, 
been on this court for 19 years, and in the words of a great old Brad Paisley country song, I wish you'd stay. <laughs> Justice Sullivan has been part of a court that has become one of the very best in the nation. Many words were spoken on the topic in this room just a month ago when we marked the retirement of Chief Justice Shepard, and all of them were true. I need not repeat that record today, but I can promise to do my best to uphold the tradition. It is a high standard that Randy Shepard, Frank Sullivan, Ted Bohm, and their colleagues have set. It is humbling and sobering that the responsibility has passed in part to me. Excuse me. The great Sarah Evans Barker, who with her federal colleagues cannot be here today because of the Seventh Circuit Conference in Chicago, sent me a beautiful handwritten note upon the news of my appointment with advice I will cherish and take to heart. She said, you will no doubt discover what all judges soon come to know, and that is that there really isn't any effective way to prepare the meet, to meet the kinds of challenges that will confront you. You simply learn by doing, and for that to work, you have to treat each case and each decision as important as the one before and the one that will come after it. Meeting these challenges and responding properly will make the work hugely satisfying and fulfilling. I have no doubt that she is right, both in her advice and prediction. But I can also tell you this. We will not always get it right. For all the wisdom in this room, we cannot create heaven on earth in a court system that resolves disputes and imposes punishment. I once heard Charles Colson say it was the ultimate conceit of man to believe he can create heaven on earth. Colson, who went to prison in the Watergate scandal, but later built a meaningful life ministering the prison inmates until his death two weeks ago, may have been qu quoting C.S. Lewis, but in any event, he went on to say that both ends of the political spectrum are guilty of this hubris. The left believing it possible through the coercive power of government, the right through the invisible hand of the free market. He was talking about something a little broader than our case law, to be sure, but his point still applies. We are fallible as we are human. Our public institutions reflect it, and we should have the humility to acknowledge it. So what can we promise? A British journalist once went to see Mother Teresa of Calcutta to do a story on her mission in one of the worst slums on Earth. Seeing the despair that surrounded, he asked her how she could ever hope to be successful. She took his hand and quietly said, God doesn't expect us to be successful. He expects us to be faithful. And so it is with this court and my 20% role in it. I cannot promise you that I or that we will always be successful in finding the right outcome. But we will be faithful, faithful to the rule of law, faithful to the principles of equal justice, faithful to a promise of patient and civil treatment of lawyers and litigants, or as Socrates defined the judge's charge, to hear courteously to answer wisely, to consider soberly, and to decide impartially. That is my promise to you today, to strive every day to meet Judge Barker's challenge, courteously, wisely, soberly, impartially, not perfectly, but faithfully. I thank you all again for making this a truly unforgettable day for my entire family. God bless you all in this honorable court. Thank you. As you now know, his colleagues have been working with Justice Massa for about a month. And in that time, we have discovered what Governor Daniels obviously knew, that Mark Massa is a remarkable person.
He's gifted with sound judgment and common sense, civility, respect, humility, and dignity, enormous industry and energy, tremendous oral and written communication skills, significant trial and administrative experience, impressive maturity, and a passion for the work of the court. I also note it's my understanding that Justice Mass's appointment represents the culmination of his family's Hoosier roots. His father, or his grandfather, and his great grandfather were residents of Vermilion County, where they were coal miners years ago. Mark, we're delighted to have you back in Indiana and as one of our colleagues, and we look forward to many years serving with you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, sir. This concludes our formal investiture program. Thank you all for attending. We invite you to attend the informal reception in the atrium out the doors. You may also enter the rear doors to the library where you'll be escorted on, on around if you wish. Again, thank you for your presence here today. All right.